for God is good. Looking forward to the time in the near future when we can once again be together in person on Wednesday nights. Uh, not a matter of us not meeting because of COVID. <clears throat> it's a matter of being able to facilitate that with the uh, other places shut down. In other words, we would meet if we could, uh, if we had a place. Um, not not because we are concerned that you would get sick. The, uh, other places shut but down. anyway, um, praise the Lord. It's coming soon. It's coming real soon. Hallelujah. And... Um, I'm looking forward to seeing y'all on Wednesday nights and, and in person. And, uh, of course, on Sundays we are. But I'm looking forward to seeing you all the time. Praise the Lord. Um, hallelujah. All righty. Well, we are continuing in our ongoing series, The Bible in the Light of Our Redemption by E.W. Kenyon, a basic Bible course from Genesis through Revelation. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we encourage you to order this, even for, well, I know we're in lesson 12, but uh, these lessons you can go back and pick up with, and, and we are, these are all online, so you can pick them up and, and catch up um, at any time. <clears throat> but I, I encourage you, this should be in your library. This book should be in your library. Uh, I encourage you to have it there. And, um, and of course, he has an advanced Bible study course that also should be in your library. Uh, as a matter of fact, about not, not much, much he's print, written you shouldn't have in your library. Uh, I don't know of anything, so uh, I just encourage you to get it. Hallelujah. Uh, last week, we were talking about the, um, the Israelites uh, coming out of Egypt, uh, in the, and they were in the wilderness. And we're going to uh, move into tonight with the law and the tabernacle. Now, <clears throat> God appeared to Israel numerous times throughout the uh, their time in the wilderness, and, and, and in a special manner. Remember, now God had to deal with them after the flesh. They were spiritually dead. They weren't born again. They could He couldn't speak to them spiritually. They had to be do it in manifestations that they could see, taste oh, the senses. There's, he had to He had to talk to them or minister to them through their senses. Um, when they did wrong, they murmured. And they rebelled, and he would manifest himself in a cloud. Um, you know, plagues would come, fiery serpents, and uh, then they would be afraid and repent and so forth. Um, <clears throat> remember, they encamped by the 12 springs of Elam, and um, God had blessed them. They murmured at Mar Mariah, Mar Mar Mara, uh, because of the badness, the bitterness of the water. Um <clears throat> All these different things. One thing they did not uh, complain about was having no, not having enough bread. They, they uh, had enough bread evidently oh. supplied, but they left Egypt. Um, but then it began to run out, and um, they began to think. Begin to think. Well, what are we going to do? We ran out of bread. We're not going to have anything to eat. We're out here, you know, going towards this wilderness, and um, they began to meditate on the worst case scenario. And you tell me to say something. God is their covenant God. God ha is and always has been our Jehovah Jireh, the Lord I provide that provides. Um, he he didn't just become Jehovah Jireh at the sacrifice or the the, the uh, challenge to Abraham to offer up Isaac that the Lord provided Himself a ram and He was called Jehovah Jireh. He was already that's already who He was. It was just revealed there. That's who he was. And God, this opportunity after opportunity after opportunity with the children of Israel to reveal another side of himself of who he is. Okay? He didn't become Jehovah Rapha in Exodus 15. He was already Jehovah Rapha. Okay? That's who he was, is, and always will be. You know, you know, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, um, they are looking now. They're, they're beginning to look at a situation where um, they are about to run out of bread or food, and they begin to murmur. Shocker! Um, to go continue going forward would, would, in their eyes, be a certain fate of death. But to retreat and go back toward Egypt, you know, was also impossible. Um, they could perish before they retraced their steps and, and even get back to Egypt. And so they start murmuring in Exodus 16, 2 and 3. This is what they say. The whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. 
And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat, <clears throat> we did eat bread to the full, for you have brought forth us into this wilderness to kill us, this whole assembly with hunger. Right. God brought them that far. God delivered them with the plagues. I mean, you know, the plagues on Egypt, the supernatural signs and wonders, splits the Red Sea, brings them over on dry ground, does all this stuff, the pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And he does all that for one reason, to bring them out to the wilderness and let them die of hunger and starvation. <clears throat> we can become so silly. We begin, an unbelief is always silly. <clears throat> All unbelief always makes no sense because it's fear motivated. Okay? You know, and God's brought us this far to get us to this place just so he can take us out. See, lack of concept of who God is. Here they are in a place they're going to need to eat They've already seen God work miracles. Already seen God supernaturally bring them out and bring them out wealthy. Drown the horse and the rider in the midst of the sea. Done all kinds of stuff. And instead of murmuring, they could have said, well, God will supply. He's already proven himself. But they didn't. Um. They could have said, well, hadn't God already uh, proven himself true to the fact that he's our covenant God? And God remembered his friend Abraham. Remember when we were talking about Moses being sent to deliver the children of Israel? The Bible says that God had remembered his covenant with Abraham. He made a promise to Abraham. And God did in, in fulfillment of that covenant. Um, the failure of the bread supply was alarming, but he who had miraculously delivered them from Egypt, led them through the Red Sea, led them by the cloud, made the bitters water sweet, could easily provide the bread. Makes you think of that song um, that I don't know whoever, I don't, I don't know anybody else that sings it. I'm sure the other people that sang it, but Raymond Singers and Band used to sing it years ago. Andy Durant would always be the lead singer. He'll do it again. He'll do it again. Just, just like he did for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, just like Moses, just like all the, I'm trying to think of how the, the, the different things in the song right now, but huh? Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he'll do it again. Oh yes, okay, he'll do it again. He is the God who sustains us even in time of famine. And the interesting thing is, we, we read this um, a couple weeks ago when we're talking about faithfulness on our Sunday morning series on the fruit of the Spirit. The Bible got, says this, if we deny him, he cannot deny himself. He's faithful. God is faithful to his covenant. God is doing his part of the covenant all the time. Amen. Hallelujah. Think of the difference it would have been had the children of Israel turned and said, God will supply our need. God will deliver us from the lack of bread. Instead, they're murmuring and complaining. So God has to show up. <clears throat> and in the midst of their murmuring and complaining, because Moses comes and said, you know, I got the knuckleheads here. <laughs> do something with them. I can't do anything with them. And um, God sends manna. And remember, they were, they were given instructions on how to gather it up, when to gather it up, gather it up twice as much on the day before the Sabbath so they wouldn't have to go out and work on the Sabbath. <clears throat> and then, you know, then, then they get complaining about eating too much manna. And so he sends quail. To, he said, I'm going to send it until it comes out your nostrils. Um, that don't sound too inviting, but anyway. Hallelujah. But see, God's trying... God is working towards 
them gaining a revelation that he is the God that keeps covenant. He honors his word. He will do what he said he would do. And they would trust him. And um, one of the things that Hebrews 11 or 10 says that, um, that we're not to harden our heart as they did in the day of provocation. Wherefore, he swore they would not enter into his rest. Okay. But so, and so they get complaining, talk about, oh man, it was so great back there in Egypt. At least we had pots full of flesh and, bread, and our stomachs were full of bread. And now you're out here going to die in the wilderness. Dear Lord, they, they could not get God to deny himself. So uh, he gave to them the promise that he would supply them with bread and meat and that they might um, know he was their covenant God. And Exodus 16 gives us you know, the sending of the bread, manna, and the meat, and the instructions how to gather it. And for 40 years, he provides manna and quail for them to eat supernaturally. They go out every morning, and, and it would rot. If you didn't gather it up today, it would rot. It was no good tomorrow. It had to be gathered today. Okay? The bread of life has to be fresh in your life. It has to be fresh daily. Okay? And so he's attempting to demonstrate the miraculous covenant-keeping God who honors his word to his covenant people. And um, it, it's, it's a constant miracle thing he has to do because they're so carnal. And, and buddy, if they, you, don't, you don't get miracle today, they're, they're, they're back serving the false gods tomorrow. They're just, they're, they're, they are fleshly. They are fleshly. I, I remember... When I first got saved, um, I was in my, I, I, was, I grew up Pentecostal holiness. We had a, you know, I was in Pentecostal holiness church and Janie and I were dating and we got but born again, baptized in the Holy Ghost. Um, I was a week and a half ahead of her and, um, but she came in, praise the Lord, slid right on down that ditch bank. Praise God. Um, I grew up Pentecostal holiness. She grew up heathen and um, I don't know if she was listening or not. <laughs> Hallelujah. And um, praise the Lord. And what was I going to say with that? Oh, praise God. Oh, yeah, now I know what I'm saying. And um, we had this sub group in the church um, that were more spiritual than everybody else because uh, the pastor didn't flow in the gifts of spirit enough for them. He wasn't powerful enough for them. So they had their own cottage prayer meet. And we'd have to go over to the cottage. So we, we, we were just young, serving the Lord. We were excited about God. We just did everything everybody was doing. We, we didn't know. They didn't have any spiritual discernment at that time or maturity or anything. Well, <clears throat> my wife, the Cherokee side of my wife didn't trust anybody anyway. Um, <clears throat> but I was gullible. And so I'd go to these, we'd go to these meetings. She'd follow me everywhere I went, you know. And um, we, we go to these college prayer meetings and they were, they were prophesying meetings. You know, we had the prayer chair, which usually was the prophecy chair. Now, I don't demean the gifts of the spirit or mock the gifts of the spirit, but flaky people do flaky things under the guise of the gifts of the spirit. That, that's as much Holy Ghost as, well, I can't, I can't even find a description for it. So every week, you know, everybody was, you know, you get in the middle of the room in the prayer chair, everybody would lay hands on you, and about 30 people would prophesy over you something, you know. And um, <clears throat> and it just, you know, just every week you go, and you get another word, you get another word, you get another word, you get another word, you get another word. And then you get to get, it was your turn to get up and give one, you know. And a um, lot of zeal, absolutely no maturity, no no judgment let, let those that, you know, let two or three uh, speak at the most and others others judge. They want no judgment of, they want nobody judging nothing that was said. Okay? And, uh, but I remember after about six weeks or so of this, I went to one of the cottage prayer meetings and I didn't get a word. 
I didn't get to give a word. Man, I was so depressed and beaten down and felt like I had lost every, God left me because I didn't have this external, this manifestation of a gift of the spirit, which sometimes it could have been, probably a bunch of times it wasn't. Um, but I was beaten down. I, oh, I was so like, oh man. And see, that, that was carnality. That was, that was immaturity. That I needed some type of external word spoken for me to be victorious through the next week. But see, my joy comes from the Lord. It doesn't come from another word. You know, quote, quote, prophetic word. I believe in prophetic. I believe in the supernatural. I believe in the gift of prophecy. I believe in the gifts of the spirit, manifestations of them are for the church today. I believe that they are manifest in the church today. I believe that God does speak uh, words over people uh, in his time and will and purpose, but not every single time you join together, 30 people prophesying over the other 30 people. I remember we had church service in our the church I was in at the time. After I left my Pentecostal church, because um, at that time they were not um, favorable to Brother Hagen or to Brother Copeland, and I had just great, I had gone off and come back to, from Rama, and so that wasn't a real good place for me there anymore. There just wasn't a place for it. Um, you know, I mean, actually, word the denominational headquarters is sit down from that district. Don't let anybody preach Copeland or Hagen in your churches. Well, I just graduated from Rama. That'll mess up preaching. And you can understand. And so, um, but I had gone, to, I, I was in a, a church that had started, Word of Faith Church. Um, and I remember we had a guest speaker one night, and he says, Have you ever prophesied over anybody? Turn around and lay your hands on the person behind you and next to you and prophesy over them. And the whole building, about 400 people, all turned around and started saying, yeah, the Lord says, you know. And um, and I just kind of slipped out and went out the back of the sanctuary. Because I, you know, I knew better. I knew you just don't do that. It didn't work that way. You know, for what, several reasons, there's nobody there to judge it. Because everybody else is prophesying over somebody else. And you, I mean, we had all kinds. Of, we had and during that era in the church, we had all people prophesying we're supposed to get married. You know, you're, you're supposed to be my wife, or you're. You know, I knew I knew some people who um, got together to start praying, a, a female and a female. And before it was over, she was prophesying they were supposed to get married, and they did, and he did, because she prophesied him right into marrying her. I've rarely seen. A, mar a marriage that way last. Actually, I don't know of anybody. I'm not saying it hasn't. <clears throat> um, but I really, I, I can't say, I can't name one where I know that someone prophesied over somebody, yeah, you two were supposed to get married and they got married and it lasted. So, um, how far did I get down that road? And how do I get back off of that road? Oh, <clears throat> so, all that was, was needing something external to keep me going. But God wanted to reveal that he was the supernatural covenant keeping God so they would trust in him because of who he is. All right? So for 40 years, he, he had to keep working miracles to keep them on the straight and narrow or they would fly off and go, go flaky. All right? The law is given. When you study Israel, you've you got to keep in mind that they are God's covenant people. Uh, in the third month of their journey uh, after leaving Egypt, they, they're in the wilderness of Sinai. Um, God's going to give them the law. They have not been born again. The Old Testament saints were not born again. They had a promise of redemption. They were on a promissory note, but they were not born again. And so they're in the wilderness uh, and God's going to give them the law. Um, they're spiritually there. So there must be a law given that deals with them and teaches them 
through their senses to understand God's, who God is, what God's laws are, moral laws and code, etc. cetera. Um, Moses is called up into the mount and there God reviews to Moses his faithfulness to the covenant. Israel has to uh, make known whether they will obey him as their covenant God. Remember when he comes down and he begins to get the law, they have to recite things back to him. Uh, we will serve the Lord our God, etc. Um, in the three months that they've already been out there, they've already seen his faithfulness as, as a covenant-keeping promise and uh, to, it, it, as his covenant God, keeping his promises to Israel. Um, in Exodus 19, uh, we see the manifestation of God to his people. Um, again, on the on the physical sense level, they could see this fire. They could hear this. Uh, they could uh, see the smoke and the fire. Hear the voice of the trumpet, uh, but they weren't able to approach because they're spiritually dead. The law was gi given. The law that was given is the law of the covenant. And when Abraham the Abrahamic covenant was fulfilled, it was fulfilled. It came in three divisions: the commandments. Expressing the righteous will of God. Um, in other words, they, they lay out the moral code of God. Now, under the law, it says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Well, it don't say that in the new covenant. It just says, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I can go commit adultery as long as I keep the law of love. I don't have enough time to fix that stupid. Okay? If you love your neighbor, you won't commit adultery with his wife. If you love your wife, you wouldn't commit adultery against her. Duh. I mean, when Jesus said all this, uh, the, 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 love the Lord thy God with the heart, thy soul, and thy strength, and thy neighbor as thyself, on his hinge all the law and the prophets, he wasn't saying that the commandments of God weren't valid. He was saying that the law of love will fulfill those commandments. Didn't he necessarily mean that they superseded him? It meant that the law of love would fulfill those commandments. And so God gives the commandments, expressing the righteous will of God. God wants us to live a certain way, wants us to keep things set holy, keep our time with the Lord holy. Uh, he, he said the Sabbath day, but it was really keeping time with the Lord is holy. Um, the judgments... Governing the social life of Israel, you know, we, we're, right now one of the things in the churches, it's so big to be so free to do anything you want to do that there's no consequences. And that's not, <clears throat> God's liberty was not so you could go and indulge in in sinful activity in the world. You're, the, being set free was you were free from the bondage of indulging in sinful activity of the world. Not that you get to do it, it's that you're free from it. Okay? But we got this whole new narrative, you know, of grace. You know, I can do anything because I'm already pre-forgiven. I'm under grace. That's not what God was trying to teach them. God was trying to teach them to understand this is his, this is his, um, the social commandments of the Lord. He wants you to live a certain way, not because he wants to destroy you, but he wants you to liberate it because that way of life is a result of the fall and therefore a manifestation of the nature of Satan or the character of Satan or the moral code of Satan, which is a non-moral code. It's, it's amorality. And then ordinances which govern religious life. In other words, how you had to conduct the religious aspect of, of life. Um, the three elements form the law, the commandments, the ordinances, and the sacrifices. The commandments were a ministry of condemnation and of death. They were, don't do this, don't do that, don't do it this way. You're going to do it this way. <coughs> this is the way I expect it to be done. To train them in this is how this is what God wants. 
Now, we know, I mean, we're not to the New Testament yet. We're going to get there eventually. <clears throat> that the law was given to bring us to Christ because we couldn't live it out in our own ability. I get that. But God's teaching them now and establishing this now that this is the expectation I have because this is how I live. And to walk with me, you need to walk like this. Again, we learn, we do learn of grace. We do learn of mercy. We do learn that uh, Christ is in us, the hope of glory, that it's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit says, well, I get that song, but see, we're moving that direction. We're talking about now in the beginning when God's revealing these things to move us to that direction, to become the righteousness of God in Christ, to become that and to trust the Holy Spirit to empower us. So we're on this journey to that point, okay? Uh, the ordinances gave in the high priest a representative of the people with God or Jehovah, and the sacrifices gave a covering for the broken law and spiritual dead Israel. God was making provision and showing them by allegory his plan ultimately was to have an intermediary between himself and the people, which would end up being Christ the Lord, um, that there would be a covering and a um, redemption for sin between the Lord and the people. Okay? And so there was a threefold giving of the law. Commandments, judgments, ordinances. Um, now, the law was given first orally in Exodus 21 through 17. Thou shalt not have, you know, we, we get that. You just love them ten commandments. Um, at that point in time, it was given that there was no provision given for priesthood and sacrifices uh, and the act, accompaniment of, of, uh, by the judgments. Relating to the relations of the Hebrews with the Hebrew were added directives for keeping Three annual feasts in Exodus 23, 14 through 19. And that was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Harvest, and the Feast of Ingathering. Um, and instructions for the conquest of Canaan. Now, Moses was called up to receive the tablets of stone. And on the mount, he received the gracious instructions concerning the tabernacle, priesthood, and um, sacrifices. You know, more is done. You know, in the meantime, the people led by Aaron took Broke the first commandment. You, to, you know, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Moses is up there getting the commandments. First one is, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Aaron's down there building a calf for them to worship that breaks the very first one. You know? And then, you know, remember Moses throws the stones and they, they break. And they had been written with the finger of God. And then the second tablets were made. God rewrites them um, by his hand. And um, we received we received the law, and then then the tabernacle is given. Now remember, the Bible says that they built the tabernacle according to the pattern which God showed Moses in heaven. So he looked into heaven and saw heaven, the throne room of God, how it was laid out, and then the tabernacle was built according to that pattern. Here on earth, um, God wanted to dwell with his people, but because of sin, he couldn't, you know, um, some of you've seen the Raiders of the Lost Ark, <laughs> love it, love the scene where, you know, they open up the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant and, you know, all the angels come out and then they start destroying all the Germans to, you know, get, get destroyed and, um, you know, Indy's telling the girl, don't look, don't look, keep your eyes closed, whatever you do, don't look. And, um. You know, and then they all get cooked, wiped out, destroyed, and um, so forth. Not very biblical to say, um, but God did want to dwell with them, and they could not come into his presence because of sin. So he gives, it to, he has them, has, gives instructions to build a tabernacle, primarily because he wanted to be as close to his people as he could be without destroying them, he could at least come down into the Holy of Holies and sit there in the Holy of Holies and be near the people. He could be out there with them, but be near them. Now, the beautiful thing is Jesus comes and in John 1, 14 says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt 
among us. And we beheld his glory as that of the only begotten of the Father. And the word dwelt in Greek actually means tabernacled or tented. God clothes himself in flesh so he could walk with the people, touch the people, impart life to the people, heal the people, commune with the people. Hallelujah. Be in their midst and fellowship with his creation without killing them. Um. But he's been, you know, he manifested his presence to them in that pillar of fire and cloud, and they, they were always seeing that. Um, their worship was carnal. You know, he that, you know, in the New Testament, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God wants it out of our hearts, not just out of an ordinance that we have to, you know, do a wave offering or a heave offering or, you know, different things. He wanted, he wanted heart worship. But there had to be a physical place where God could come and dwell. Now, in order to build the tabernacle, he asked for um, free will offerings. Because he wanted their heart to be willing to have them, not just him saying, I'm coming. Okay, Nothing worse than to invite yourself over to somebody's house and when you get there, you realize... They really, really don't want you there. I mean, it's just obvious you're an unwelcome guest. Um, maybe you showed up with somebody as you know. You came with a, a friend was going somewhere, and uh, they said, "Well, come on with us." Uh, no, nah, they probably don't want me. Oh yeah, it won't be a problem. You walk in the door, and you know, once you get there, you really are not wanted there. That's an awkward thing. Well, God wanted them to give the money for the building so that. He knew they wanted him there in their midst. Hallelujah. God, the tabernacle was made just as God revealed it to Moses. Um, God's working towards redemption. He's setting things up. Now, if you, the cool thing is, if we, um, and we're not teaching on tabernacle tonight, but if we're teaching on the tabernacle, um, so people have done great studies on this. And, you know, they say if you were to, you know, kind of go take a, a drone view of the tabernacle and take the top off, you could see the arrangement of everything in the tabernacle and that, you know, from front to back and side to side, it's laid out like a cross. All the, the tables and the mercy seat and the Ark of the Covenant and the, you know, the showbread and the little candelabra, uh, it's laid out, it's laid out like there's a cross. Hallelujah. And um, it is a type of Christ in the church. Now, we keep looking at the tabernacle. When you start looking at the tabernacle, it's very interesting how it's built. Um, it's covered in badger skins. I'm glad I didn't have to kill them to get the stuff to build it with. That's a mean animal. I saw I saw a badger take on um, a, a lion, a lioness, on some video or somewhere, <clears throat> and um, badger badger got away. <laughs> okay, so um, it's it was built with the west western end of the court uh, is where the property of holies was. Fifty two feet long, seventeen and a half feet high, wide, seventeen and one foot half foot high. Divided into two compartments, the larger of the two was called the holy place, the uh, smaller, the most holy, or the holy of holies. <clears throat> In the larger, the holy place was the golden altar, the golden lampstand, golden table. In the holiest of all, the ark and the mercy seat. And this is where God's presence would come down. When it's erected, it was covering on the outside, was covered with badger skins with a width of goat's hair curtain above the door. Uh, the first set of curtains were fine linen, uh, fine twine linen, purple, blue, white, scarlet. Over these were goat skins dyed red, and over all was a covering of badger skins. Now, when the, when the tabernacle was at rest, the cloud, the symbol of the divine presence, rested on the rear end of the tabernacle. It was like a vast umbrella. That's because that's where the Holy of Holies was. That's where God's presence was. Cloud was always with them. 
When it moved, they had to break down everything, pack it up, and take off and run. And then it would stop. God leading them and saying, follow me without question. Follow me. <clears throat> the, the court, which, for, which was formed of 60 pillars of uh, Chittim wood, supporting the linen curtain wall, the tabernacle was a comparatively small building. It wasn't an, it wasn't an assembly building. Okay, It wasn't there to have meetings of 5,000 people. There were priestly services done in the tabernacle. Okay? But there was an, it was not an assembly. People didn't come in there and sit down, you know, in chairs, rows of 25 here, and, you know, and, and you know, and, and, and hear the sermon of the week. There was priestly duties going on there all the time. It was designed to be a place where God could dwell with and meet Israel in person in the person of their high priest. So it's not it's not an auditorium uh, for assembly. Now the coverings, um, we, so let's go on the outside. From the outside, there was nothing interesting. It was basically a, a rectangular building. All right? Um, wasn't anything architecturally cool. It was just really wasn't like attractive, you know. And, and uh, during the Dark Ages and during the, the uh, reign of the Church of Rome, uh, they took all the money of all the people and built these huge cathedrals. You can go all over Europe. I mean, all over Europe. You find some little village that you think, how in the world did they build this cathedral here? You know? I mean, it's ornate. It's I mean, you just, you're like, how in the world did they have the money to build this? And they built it, you know, grandiose and all this. And uh, here we come with the tabernacle. And it, it's just, you know, not really that cool looking. Bunch of badger skins, over tent poles. Um, so the, the badger skins cover the outside. But when you go inside, all of a sudden there's a change. On either side, the gold-covered boards gle uh, glistened in the light. The seven-branch candlestick. The ceiling was formed by the beautiful curtains of linen. The embroidered cherubim of blue, purple, and scarlet. Uh, before that's the veil behind the, the, that, the door. And all the mingled tints of the rainbow. There, there was gold, a gold altar of incense filling the holy place with its aroma. The gold table with 12 loaves of showbread, which also would emit a fragrant odor. In these coverings, we see the picture of Christ. The two different aspects. If we were to look at the outside of the tabernacle, it would have no form nor comeliness. The curtain of badger skins covering the beauty of the tabernacle. Remember the Bible says in Isaiah, he had no form, no form nor comeliness that we should desire him. In Isaiah 53, 2, there was no beauty about him that we should desire him. Um, in other words, Christ was not successful because he would have been on the cover of GQ. Sorry, I'm sorry, guys. Everybody trying to do this, this hip, cool GQ um, metro look to be, you know, be really cool. The Bible says of Jesus, he had no form nor comeliness that they should be desired of him. He was badger skin on the outside. Because it's not the appearance you give. It's what's on the inside that people need. It wasn't the tabernacle that Jesus walked in on the earth, the, the body. It was what was in that body that humanity needed. Hello. But we think if we if we are cool, if we're slick, we got the right haircut, we got the right tunic top with skinny jeans, and we're hip, and all this stuff, Baby, that ain't nothing but badger skin. And it don't mean squat. What's inside is what counts. You can be uh, whited sepulchers, but on the inside full of dead men's bones. I didn't see one single amen pop up across my screen. I didn't even get a help me Jesus come up over there. He 
he had nothing in common with man. The badger skins are typical of the severity of his separation from man. To the natural eye, there was a reserve and severity with him. It's not within our compass of understanding uh, to understand or enjoy him. He's the root out of a dry ground. The beauty of Christ was hidden. <clears throat> Only the inner few knew him. And so the blue, the purple, the scarlet, and the linen. Uh, Ezekiel 16.10 says, I shod thee with badger skins, suggesting separation from evil. Sandals protect their feet from the earth, kept them separate from it. <clears throat> we are being told today to be as much like the world as we can be. And that's going to fill our churches. It might fill your meeting place, but it's not filling the church. And I'll let that sink in for a minute or two. Just because you have a building and have the word church outside and you got people on the inside doesn't mean it's the church. And this, this narrative of being as much like the world as we can be with the thought that it's going to win people. We're putting an emphasis on something that God didn't, that uh, allegories in the scripture, typology in the scripture does not allude to at all. Hello? We have... The scripture saying he had no form nor comeliness that we should desire him. Um, and so Christ came and it, it wasn't, I mean, and John the Baptist wasn't exactly, uh, you know, Mr. Charisma either. He's coming uh, in what goat skins, eating locusts and honey. He Apparently he looked like some kind of bush man. It was a hippie. Um, and he and they were following him as he pointed them to Christ. He's the root out of the, the dry ground. Okay. But he came separate from the world. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. Now, that, 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 see, we take that to the extreme that we can't have anything to do with sinners. No. We're to go to the sinner. We're to win them to Christ. We don't become like the sinner to win them to Christ. I mean, one of the dumbest things, the dumbest things, might possibly quite be the absolute dumbest thing I've ever heard. This man and woman, and they were bragging about it in Christian circles, would invite people over to their home, couples, and do a wife-husband swap so that they could go show them the love of Christ and win them to the Lord by having sex with the other couple. You can't make this stuff up. And they were out bragging about it. It was, it was running in the Christian circles that this is, this is what better way to show how much somebody you love them, love them than to have sexual relations with them. And therefore, we're, we're just showing people the love of God. Forget all the other scriptures against that. Okay? Just, we've got it. We, we, we're showing them the love of God. Stupidity on steroids. No, we're not to be like the world. You do not have to be like the world to bring the world to Christ. You need to be like Christ to bring the world to Christ. Now, again, you can take that to another extreme and going at Pentecostal, if women didn't cut their hair and they didn't wear makeup, uh, da, 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 then they were being holy. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about there's badger skins on the outside. We are not trying to be like the world. For too long, we've, we've tried to say, well, Christians can be normal. What you're trying to say is Christians can be like the world. That's not normal. That's fallen. That's abnormal. It's not what God called us to. 
<clears throat> God did not call us to the sphere of living under the authority and control of the flesh. He called us to a whole new sphere altogether. To go up higher. I will move up higher. Okay. I think I may have hit that and we'll leave it right there because I don't want to mess it up on the second round. All right. Um, and because he walked with the Father and kept himself from the things of the world, <clears throat> all the forces of men and devils on earth could not overcome or hinder him doing the Father's will. The ram's skin dyed red, typical of his mete meteorial work, he shed blood. The inner curtains of two sets of five each uh, were held together by 50 thatches, thatches of gold, fastened into 50 loops of blue, uh, forming, as we read, one tabernacle. The loops of blue and 50 thatches of gold were typical of his heavenly grace and divine energy, which enabled Christ to perfectly meet the claims of God and men. The curtains were all of one measure. The blue, ethereal in color, marks the heavenly character of Christ. He was very man and very God. He walked in the consciousness of dignity of his divine mission. He never once forgot who he was or where he was going. Purple was, purple was typical of royalty. He was a king of the Jews and received into heaven as a conqueror. Scarlet represented his death. Um... His incarnation, the union of God and man, were not sufficient for our redemption. He must on the cross be made all that man was by his death substitution. Brought to naught for him who had the power of death and delivered man from his reign. The fine twine linen is typical of the spotless purity as a man. Every, time, every point tempted like we are, yet without sin. The great depths of spiritual truths in, in the humanity of Jesus Christ to meet the claims of justice and the needs of man, it's necessary that he be absolutely human and absolutely God. He still pleased the Father. It was necessary for Christ to walk as the first Adam should have walked. All right, next week we'll... Um, uh, actually, next week's Thanksgiving, not next week, two weeks from tonight, okay? We go into the tabernacle. There's some good stuff in there, too. I mean, there's just some, there's a lot of symbolism. Let's get into our questions. Um, we're kind of getting here late tonight. What should the Israelites, the Israelites done when they discovered their lack of food? We kind of covered that. They should have come to the covenant God with full assurance that he who has entered into a blood covenant relationship with, with the nation of Israel, would meet every need. Second, how did the covenant God meet their need for food? Now, according to Exodus 16, 14, 4 through 12, he gave them bread or manna and meat quail to eat. Why was the law given? Because the Israelites did, had not received the life of God and were spiritually dead men. They needed the law to govern every phase of their lives in order to determine whether or not they would obey God, the covenant God. They, you know, that's what that was all about. Why did God manifest himself through the smoke and fire and the cloud? Because the people were sense ruled, thus God had to manifest himself to their physical senses. And what was the purpose of the tabernacle? Since God could not dwell in the hearts of the Israelites, uh, he must have a place in which to manifest his presence in their physical senses. There must be a place for physical worship since they were unable to spiritually worship, and there must be a place of physical priesthood to meet him. How were the materials gathered and why? Well, materials were gathered through free will offerings, and the reason is the hearts must be willing to have his presence among them. And why was it necessary for, the, for it to be according to the exact pattern that God showed Moses in heaven? It had to be a type of Christ and the redemption he wrought for man. How did the badger skin covering represent Christ? As stated in Isaiah 53, 2, Christ had no form of comeliness to the natural man. There was no beauty about him 
that men should desire him. He had nothing in common with man. The badger skins are typical of the severity of a separation from man. <clears throat> it was not within their um, compass of understanding uh, of God, of men, to understand or enjoy God. And of what in the life of Christ were they typical? Now, according to Ezekiel 16.10, God would shod Jesus' feet with badger skins, thus signifying separation from evil. Sandals protect the feet from the earth, keeping them separate from it. Okay? God wanted to keep them separate from the, from the earth while ministering in the earth. Praise the Lord. Um, show how the inner curtains represented Christ. Blue or ethereal marks his heavenly character. He was God and man. Purple was the typical color of royalty. He is the king of kings or the king of the Jews at that time. Scarlet represented his death, and the fine twine linen it was typical of the spotless purity as a man. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And so God, I just think it's cool. When you begin to look at these things, it's begin to see, uh, looking back, how God was laying out everything. He made it so the priesthood couldn't miss Jesus from a hundred miles away. And he showed up and they missed him. He had all set up so there was no way they couldn't miss, they could miss him. And they missed him. He was, he was doing everything he could in the natural to make it so they, 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 there he was. There he is. This is Christ. This is the answer. So next time we're together, we're going, to get, we're going inside the tabernacle. And we'll get talking about the different things. The mercy seat, the showbread, the candelabra. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, hope you all have enjoyed this tonight. We're laying a foundation. From the time of the fall of man to the time of the manifestation of Christ, God laid the foundation for redemption. The Bible says that the things written about Israel were given to us as in samples or examples. We look into the scriptures and we see God laying it all out, bringing us to Christ to be able to live the way he designed man to live from the very beginning in a relationship with the father and his family. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Sure love all of you. <clears throat> we bless you in the name of Jesus and want to remind you once again of these uh, words from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. God bless you. We love you. See you next time here at Faith and Victory Church. And have a, uh, if those who, who join us on Wednesday nights only, uh, have a wonderful Thanksgiving. We'll see you back here the Wednesday night afterwards. Um, until then, be blessed. Don't overeat too much. Hallelujah. God bless you. Good night.